wasn't easy. So I'm going to stop. Um, uh, I can talk about this forever. Uh, I have a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, experience of uh, dealing with this situation. But we have uh, th four wonderful speakers, including my co-curator. So I'm going to introduce them uh, in the order of their uh, presentation. So firstly, uh, Agnieszka Koleg. Uh, Agnieszka um, um, is at the Ujazdowski uh, Castle Center. Uh, and she's uh, been promoted to head of education, so I'm very delighted about her new appointment here. But she's also a, a, a curator and an artist, and she co-founded a, a very um, uh, forward, free-thinking um, uh, platform called Passion for Freedom, uh, which was an arts festival that took place in London. Um, it was a, a, an exhibition program that supported artists who were forbidden to exhibit their arts. They were uh, a lot of artists from the Middle East, particularly women, um, making work against uh, Islamic theocracies. And um, uh, Agnieszka's uh, curation or co-curation of that festival um, really exposed the silence of um, many um, uh, individuals who, who just felt they couldn't speak in authoritarian regimes. And, uh, and challenge the comfortable positions of those who inhabit, uh, particularly in the West, uh, inhabit uh, safe spaces. Uh, Agnieszka actually survived uh, a terror attack in Copenhagen back in 2015, in 2015. And uh, at that meeting, that public discussion, she actually continued uh, the meeting even when the Islamists were attacking uh, uh, the space uh, with guns. Um, and um, the meeting was on the subject of art and blasphemy. And uh, after the attack, she continued. She said that they not only want to kill us, they want to silence us. They want to stop us talking. So we should continue. I think uh, Aniska is a very brave woman, um, uh, and I have great admiration for her. Uh, second uh, 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 on the panel, um, speaking is Professor Frank Furedi, who's um, uh, sitting on my left here. Uh, and he's a great inspiration for me. I've known, uh, I've read uh, Frank's works and his writings for uh, as, l as old as my child, for at least 20 years. Um, the book Paranoid Parenting, when I was um, uh, a father uh, with my child in 2001, um, was uh, a Bible for me to stop feeling paranoid and not panic about being a parent. So uh, I'll never forget that book. But uh, Frank is uh, an, a very well-known sociologist and social commentator. And, uh, and since the late 1990s, he's been widely cited about his views on why Western societies find it so difficult to engage with risk and uncertainty. He's published widely about controversies relating to issues such as health, parenting, as I mentioned, uh, food and new technology. Uh, he's written many books, but to highlight uh, two or three books, um, one, uh, in 2017, uh, he published a book called A Hundred Years of Identity Crisis, Culture War Over Socialization. Uh, in the book, he argued that the principal driver of the crisis of identity was and continues to be the conflict surrounding the socialization of young people. In turn, the politicization of this conflict provides a terrain on which the culture wars and the politicization of identity can flourish. His books and articles offer an authoritative uh, and lively account of key developments in contemporary cultural life. Using his insights as a professional sociologist, he's produced a series of agenda-setting books that have been widely discussed. Um, another recent book, which uh, is highly relevant to this uh, uh, discussion, uh, is called Populism and the European Culture Wars, the Conflict of Values Between Hungary and the EU. And uh, another book, which is called Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down, um, uh, all highly relevant and important books, which um, really talks about the importance of national sovereignty and democracy. Uh, Frank is well known as a television and radio um, uh, commentator. He's been on many uh, uh, mainstream channels, uh, and uh, his books have been translated in 13 languages. He's... Uh, um, uh, known in Australia, Canada, the United States, uh, here in Poland. Um, he has sp sp spoken previously the Netherlands uh, and many other countries. So um, I'm really looking forward to Frank's uh, uh, presentation and also Vicky Richardson. Now, Vicky um, is, uh, again, a very well-known um, uh, 
voice in um, uh, architecture and uh, in the cultural sector. She's an architectural curator with a wide range of experience in the UK and overseas. Uh, in 2021, of uh, a year ago, uh, April 2021, she became head of architecture and the, and the Drew Hines curator at the Royal Academy of Arts, uh, which is a very important and prestigious um, uh, arts, uh, arts centre and exhibition space and teaching space in, in England. Uh, she's uh, curated many uh, exhibitions um, uh, where the uh, art and uh, uh, architecture um, intersect. And um, she was previously head of architecture, design and fashion at the British, at the British Council and um, was the commissioner uh, of the British Pavilion at the Venice uh, Architecture Biennial. Um, she's also an, an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I think that's what REBA stands for. And uh, in 2015 was named by de Bretz as one of the 20 most influential um, people in British architecture. Lastly, um, I'm so delighted that we have um, uh, an eminent Polish writer. Um, you may have to forgive me, uh, I didn't, uh, in terms of pronouncing your name, but is it Rafael Z Zemkiewicz? Uh, my, my Polish pronunciation is dreadful, so um, please forgive me if I don't uh, pronounce uh, uh, as well as I should. Uh, so Rafael is a, a writer and political commentator and is probably one of the most influential people in Polish conservatism. Uh, he's published over 30 books and most of them um, top-selling novels um, uh, in the past, and I would love to read them um, when they get published in English, um, because uh, uh, having done some research, they are subjects that I feel very um, uh, uh, closely attached to, science fiction particularly. Um, so on social media, he has uh, over 200,000 followers, and um, as a writer, um, he published his first uh, uh, fiction in 1987. Um, he specializes in Polish literature uh, and uh, he began his career, um, as I mentioned, um, writing science fiction novels and short stories. Uh, but since the 1990s, he's mostly worked as a journalist. And in 2005, he published mostly, mainly non-fiction writing uh, on social and political issue issues as well as historical um, subjects. Uh, he has a, a, a very popular YouTube channel, um, hashtag Zemkiewicz, um, Zemkiewicz. Uh, and he has 120,000 subscribers, so obviously a very popular uh, local hero. Um, so that's uh, a quick introduction to our fantastic speakers. I'm going to pass my um, microphone to Agnieszka, who's going to give us an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Manik, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that today marks the anniversary of a series of coordinated Islamic terrorist attacks that targeted commuters traveling on the city tra public transport system during the morning rush hour in London. 70 years ago, today, 50 ta 52 people were murdered and hundreds more were injured. I'm grateful to the community of 77 survivors for including me in the community and giving me support after my attack in Copenhagen because all of my survivors stayed in, in Denmark and I was on my own in London. I also thank Sari Zinger for, from Strength to Strength organization for bringing us together. And please keep them in your thoughts and prayers, um, the survivors, their families, and also those that were killed. Uh, it's a very special time because it reminds everyone of the threat of terror around the world and that it could happen to anyone at any time. Uh, so first I would like to present the works of Jan Bortkiewicz. Uh, he's a Polish photographer, uh, also photography lecturer at the State Academy of Fine Arts in Wroclaw. Uh, one of his works uh, was being used for the, for the posters promoting our event. Uh, let's just wait for the uh, for the image to come up. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the the full image that we used just a part of for the promotion of the event. So um, his works in a, are are in collections around the world. Um, he's uh, well established here in the, in the Polish artistic circles, and I think his work st um, stands out because it was created before uh, Poland joined European Union. And um, 
at this time uh, he played with the with the images and with um, the public perception of what it means to join uh, European Union and what it means for the future of Poland. And at this time he he wrote a, a text and I, I selected few parts of this text to, to quote here. He wrote it in 2001. Uh, we've been positioned in the center of Europe for centuries. Since recently we've been living in a free and democratic country where the average Poles great greatest problem is the problem of survival. The integration process brings about unification. For example, nations in every respect poorer, which have been destroyed, uh, which have destroyed their identity to get closer to the European Union at any price shall disappear. Political unity of the United States of America is warranted by the common language. United Europe also needs an adhesive of its official language. For so far, it has its common currency. Thousands of clerks in Brussels deal with globalization, standardization, unification, and uniformization of everything around us. But they are helpless in the face of new epidemics because they are busy determining standards of fat and protein content of cheese and plotting what to do to keep the tastes of tomato and strawberry, albeit of similar color, other than that of the, the tastes of the distilled water. Analyzes are underway for manuals being developed for a ladder. Um, so this is the first of his works. It's called Eurotong. Uh, please put the second image. The Euro hat. So we have a variation of uh, um, of playing with the image of the of the flag of how it's being positioned and and in a sense how do we feel with adopting this new identity and trying to have it implanted um, in a in an already set certain context. S next image, please. Uh, that was also in relation to creating the wooden pallets and how much it costs as a, as a market value, but then how the forests are being destroyed for creating them. Next image, please. And the final one, please. Uh, that's the son of the photographer. I like the sense of humor. Uh, and now I would like to show the works of another artist from Britain. It would be the next uh, presentation. Her name is Jan Bowman. Uh, Manig also knows her. Originally, she is from Scotland via Canada. Jo Bowman trained as an architect. Her drawings uh, form a visual diary and her pictures tell stories. She's inspired by humanity, democracy, gardening, ancient Greek vase paintings, and songs about 21st century angst. In 2018, an architect's office invited her to give a talk about her children's picture book on the Enlightenment. This is Birmingham, a glimpse of a city's secret treasures. It's a graphic no history of the Lunar Society, free thinkers, scientists, doctors, and inventors who played a leading role in the 18th century Enlightenment. It describes how Birmingham was built by immigrants and illustrates some of the hidden treasures of this underrated city. Shortly afterwards, she was disinvited after the employees discovered that she supported Brexit. She never heard back from them again. Jan says, this experience made me rethink my actions since the 2016 referendum. Shortly after that, someone had posted a comment on my blog saying he'd never have bought one of my prints if he'd known I was pro-Brexit. Like many others, I immediately censored myself for fear of losing work. I deleted his comment from my blog. I even mo moved my democracy pictures to the back of my online shop. Now, I realize that the political has become personal and keeping quiet is no defense at all. You may as well be upfront about it and defend what you believe in. That way you won't have a Guantanamo Bay stewing in your head later. Your views may lose you some friends and clients, but we have to have faith in people's good sense. I believe most people will agree that shunning someone in case their ideas may offend you is a dangerous mistake. 
Without free speech and tolerant debate, democracy can't survive. So these are a series of works that uh, Jan has created in relation to the vote and her experiences. So this is the first one. I really love this image. Um, can I have the next image, please? Because there's, uh, I think it's four images and they play with the idea of um, promoting the value of democracy, the true democracy where people can have a say. And then also um, the view of how is it with the democratic vote and the elites and their views on what is good for us? Next uh, image, please. And the fi final one, please. And this one I love the most because it's very important to, to laugh and have a sense of humor. You are familiar with this work, Manik? Yes. Right, this one, it was quite common when there were lots of memes being uh, sent around about comparing it to the relationship when it goes sour and whether you should stay or you should go and what are the usual um, reasons for you to stay. Uh, thank you. And the, the final presentation, there's just a few slides. And for this, I will have questions. So um, the first question I have is, what is the role of the supranational state when planning and implementing cultural programs? What could be the result of program that treads in a space that should be openly and honestly discussed, especially around these issues? Next slide, please. Assigning value to sexual orientation and life choices, taking puberty blockers, having life-altering operations before being 18, pushing for laws that remove the role of a parent in their child's life, creating a precedent for a state having power of the, over the youngest and the most vulnerable children. Next slide, please. Uh, this subject also begs questions around what should be the priority in money spending at the time of war, not only on the ground in Ukraine, but also in the virtual space where we have to deal with this information discrediting countries as a tool in the long-term war plan, sowing discord and division internally within countries. What is the flexibility of these supranational bodies when the reality changes dramatically overnight? Would they be happy to continue these programs at the time when the enemies are at the gates? And the next slide, that's it, thank you. So these are my questions and I'm really curious to hear the voices of our guests and the questions from the audience afterwards. Thank you, Agnieszka. So I'm going to pass now to Professor Frank Fioedi. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's always nice to be in a city that used to be dominated by the Soviet Union. Um, it kind of reminds me of my own home city, which is Budapest, and there are a lot of similarities. I think that uh, the question of cultural politics and cultural tension is really very important because the moment we begin to talk about politics and culture in the same breath, it destroys the artistic and the aesthetic integrity of the art that you're producing. Of course, we all have political ideals, but as an artist or as, an, as a writer, we, what we produce, if it's good art and if it's, it's proper cultural product, it's something that has got a, a value in and of itself uh, that is quite separate from a political message. This is something that the European Union doesn't understand. I always remember in 2007, I was doing a book tour in different parts of Europe. And I went to Budapest first. And I noticed that everywhere I went, there were these European Union leaflets that they had in museums. And the leaflets always said, we in Hungary and the European Union, we believe in uh, important European values. I said, that's really good, you know, European values are good. Then I look at the European values that they believe in. Number one was diversity, which means like the many. Number two, inclusion. And I'll, I'll talk about inclusion later on where you ask, you raise the question of including to what. Number three was the environment. We believe in the environment. Who doesn't believe in the environment? I mean, you've got to be Frankenstein if you don't think that the environment is important. And number four, it was about gay liberation and LBGTQ, blah, blah, blah. 
kind of plus kind of, uh, kind of context. Now, I know Hungarians, and I know that most Hungarians, you know, most ordinary, normal Hungarians, you know, would not support these European values. But nevertheless, these were everywhere. A week later, I go to Barcelona. I'm very excited, you know, I'm very excited. This is the first time that uh, my book is in Spanish, and I'm, you know, kind of looking forward to it. And as I walk, you know, on the streets in Barcelona, there, there are these EU stalls. And I look at the stalls, and they got these leaflets. And the leaflets have got the same color, more or less as in Hungary. And it says the same thing in Catalonia and in the European Union. We believe in inclusion, diversity, the environment, and LGBTQ+, blah, blah, blah. You know, the same message, but only thing that was different, that instead of Hungary, it had Catalonia. I thought, it was, I thought it was bizarre. And then, and I'm not lying to you, I'm not lying to you at all, I go to a, a discussion of one of my books in Narbonne in France. And as it happens, there is a big cultural festival there. And there too, there are the same leaflets, but this time it's not Catalonia, it's not Hungary, it's the people of France who believe in inclusion, everything else. So basically, uh, what you got here is this kind of administratively produced statement about values and culture, right? Administratively produced that seeks to homogenize the cultural experience of every country in Europe. Somehow, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your history and organic relationship is, you all believe in the same thing. It's a little bit like when the Soviet Union was dominating East Europe. You know, you went to Albania, you went to Bulgaria, you went to Poland, you went to Hungary, and you went to Romania, and you saw the same beautiful pictures of tractors, you know, sort of, and people smiling. And, you know, the only difference was that the letter was in Polish or in Hungarian, but it was the same kind of homogenized message that was being put forward. Now, obviously, there's a difference between Stalinist depiction of reality and the European Union, Although sometimes I think the difference is not as much as, as you think. Uh, but what, what basically what you've got here is a situation where culture becomes totally instrumentalized. In other words, what's important about culture is that it's what it's used for. In other words, culture becomes something that you try to achieve, something separate that's independent of what's really happening. Now, I'm using the word culture, but you see, if you look at the, the meaning of the word culture, the Latin meaning of the word culture, it's about cultivation. It's about cultivating something. It's about uh, something that is organic to what has happened beforehand. It's organic to the lives and to the history and the experience of the people. I mean, culture is not something that you buy in a supermarket. It's not something that you produce in an office. Culture is something that has evolved over the centuries. It's taken different forms and different shapes. And through the uh, uh, sort of the transmission of the experience and the values, then you have the creation of what is a kind of aesthetic and cultural sensibility. And if it's a genuine product of culture, then I would expect that Polish expressions of cultural norms will not be the same as in England, I would be very surprised if they were, and if they are, then you know, it's not culture. It's kind of more like a reality television rather than anything else or something akin to that. So what you got in, in a sense is, uh, when we're talking about the EU, is not culture in the way that we understand it because what is interesting about the European Union is that uh, it decided from the beginning of its existence that it wants to separate itself from the past. You know, I can understand why the past was very bad. Second World War was horrible. You want to leave the past behind. But if you want to completely separate yourself from the past, to break with history, what you also end up doing is you're leaving behind the uh, incredible creative accomplishments of the Renaissance, of the Enlightenment, of the Christian and Judeo-Christian tradition of what Rome gave to us. Because all those things you now see as somehow 
belonging to a different era. And what you do is you begin with what we call a year, a year zero culture, which is that culture and history begins in 1946. And that's what the European Union tries to do. And if you don't believe me, you should go to the History Museum in Brussels. Because in Brussels, you go into the museum and you walk around and you almost, you, you can get the impression that before 1946, there was no history. You, know, you don't talk about what has gone on beforehand because you, s you kind of feel that this is embarrassing or it's wrong. We don't want to teach young people about what has gone on beforehand. So that's basically what culture means. Now the problem is, is that if you have given up on the legacy of the past, if you've given up on the cultural influences that are organic to people's experiences, if you've done that, then you're left with a problem that we in philosophy call the problem of normativity. What the problem of normativity means is what are the norms, what are the values that underpin the European Union? What does this mean to have European values? You know, what, is it, you know, what, what is that really all about? And if you haven't got that kind of connection with the history and the past of, the, of European cultures and societies, then what you're left with is uh, uh, the only possible thing that you can do, which is you have to invent new values. You have to administratively produce a new culture, right? Now the trouble is that when you produce an, an administratively produced culture, it, it can never be satisfactory. Because the one thing that we've learned from history is that administratively produced values do not have the moral depth, the moral connection to motivate people. And one of the things that we find as a result is that in Europe, uh, cultural, what they call cultural politics becomes this desperate attempt to try to find one, some kind of a way of legitimizing the political outlook of the European Union. So what are the values of the European Union, the cultural values of the European Union? And where do they come from? Well, if you ex examine the documents, the cultural related documents that are produced in Brussels, you find that the so-called European values are not European at all. I mean, for example, if you look at the most recent documents about values, European values, they, they're producing a book for children all over Europe because they're worried that children don't appreciate the European Union. The values that they want young people to embrace and to, uh, and to uh, adopt are values that are, you can see on Netflix. They're values that are produced in the United States they are very much values that are rooted in what we call the cultural politics of identity. Right? It's all about identity politics. It's all about you know, making people uh, sort of uh, uh, embrace identity politics. And that's why you will have a situation where the European Union's office in Kyiv puts out a, this is the middle of the war, puts out a tweet saying, let's make Kyiv queer again. Right? So the, the, the objective of the European Union in, in the Ukraine is to put forward LGBTQ propaganda. That's the kind of values that they want to promote under those kinds of circumstances. And that I think is, it seems to me to be a, a very big uh, problem. So basically what you've got is a kind of cultural uh, attempt to use the resources of social engineering together with identity politics as a way of giving legitimacy to what being European is really all about. And I want to end by uh, looking at two little values. First of all, the, the value of diversity. Now, I think that the attempt to make diversity into value is stupid because what diversity means is many. You know, and there are many kinds of people, but that's not a value. That's a, that's a kind of uh, appreciation of reality. But what's interesting about the value of diversity in the European Union is that they believe in every kind of diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, diversity to, to do with uh, sort of people's kind of regional behavior. But the one diversity that Brussels hates 
The one diversity that they totally reject is the diversity of nations. In other words, the diversity of nations or national differences, they think is a, bad, is a problem because nations, by definition, are seen as being the very opposite to what you want to do. So you no longer have a European Union of Nations, but what you have is a European Union where the nations are seen as the problem that Brussels needs to solve. So that's on diversity. The second value is inclusion. And inclusion is, sounds good. You want to include people. We don't want to push them out. But the question becomes, inclusion into what? You know, what are you including people in? Right? Because are you including people in a dynamic, you know, sort of cultural space where aesthetic and artistic experience, you know, is really, a, really kind of challenging people? Or are you including people into this administratively produced, bureaucratically approved, kind of really boring conformist uh, sort of cultural uh, sort of politics that you kind of put forward. And it seems to me that what we're left with when we're looking at the situation today is a systematic attempt to deprive culture of its organic relationship to people and at the same time a systematic attempt to, in a sense, empty culture of its aesthetic and creative potentialities. And to that extent, it's not a hundred miles away from old school Stalinist social realism or old school Stalinist culture. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to come to Warsaw. It's a real pleasure to be in this city and to uh, be with a live audience discussing ideas. Um, I, uh, I feel a bit like going in, I'm going into an exam where I've, I've been cheating and reading somebody's speech, but I promise you, although I agree with a lot of the points that Frank made, I didn't read his speech beforehand, um, but I do have some quite, I suppose, some quite similar points to make. Um, I've got some pictures though, so I have the, ad the advantage. Um, <laughs> maybe you can show my first slide. Um, I came across this manifesto at the Tate, uh, the Tate Gallery, Tate Britain, where I was earlier this week. And I was just really interested in, by it. It's in, a, it's in a special archive gallery at, at the Tate, and it's a manifesto from June 2014 um, written by the Italian futurist Marinetti and, a, and an English artist, Nevinson. And uh, as you can see, Vital English Art, the Futurist Manifesto. And it's really a kind of outpouring of, um, you know, kind of horror at British tradition and English art, which it says is the soft, sweet, uh, mediocre, um, medievalism, garden cities, uh, with their curfews, artificial battlements, the Maypole Morris dancers, the pre-Raphaelites and neo-primitives. It's just really expressing this complete horror at English um, traditional art. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's standing up for experimentation, the countercultural, the future, everything we know of the Italian futurists. And I thought, this is so interesting because this is, um, this is the sort of artist as the counter countercultural revolutionary, and obviously from a period where everybody was writing manifestos uh, about the future. But I thought I was thinking at the time about this connection between, um, you know, what is an official uh, sort of political entity, the European Union, and culture and art, um, because they're strange bedfellows, really. Why would an organization that's, uh, that's this political entity, why would they invest so much money in culture and arts? Um, and I think that this manifesto gives us a kind of clue as to what is attractive about the arts um, for an organization like the EU, because it's sort of, um, I think that what the EU is trying to do through its Creative Europe Fund is to align itself with the kind of creativity, but also the kind of radicalism and countercultural nature of, of the arts and, and artists and the way um, the position that artists have adopted for, you know, really since um, the era of manifestos in the early 20th century. 
Um, so I, I wanted to, to, one of the things I wanted to ask is, why is culture so important to the European Union? But also, why is culture such a useful tool for, for the European Union in its mission to um, unify what is actually a, a very disparate and um, a dynamically changing kind of region? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, Europe as a, as a political entity, um, we know that uh, for a very long period of time, there have been arguments and debates about where the edges of Europe lie. Where is the, where is the border between East and West? Um, and this is a constantly changing thing. It has been a constantly changing thing. And even now, whether you're in or out is, we know, a, hu a huge debate. This is a very fragile organization. And I think that um, we need to consider you know, quite carefully the, the role that culture plays in this situation. And I would totally agree with Frank about these, um, the set of values being projected. And I would be suspicious really about any organization that tries to use culture to, to this extent. I mean, if we look at it, um, even in this period of austerity, of uh, global insecurity, the, the Creative Europe Fund at the EU is, uh, has increased by I think almost a billion euros for this funding period, 2.24 billion euros for the next six years, um, which is a huge increase um, for, in terms of what they were spending before. Um, this is a really hugely important part of, of, of the EU. And I think it has become keen to, key to maintaining this, this kind of, uh, this idea of what, the, of what this entity is. And, and just to look at some of the reasons why culture is a good vehicle for sharing ideas and values. I mean, I think, I think the thing is that there is something integral to the arts, which is about connective, connectedness. I mean, the arts do connect us. Um, and so the EU hasn't invented that, at least. I mean, um, we know that for centuries, artists have traveled. Uh, we've shared ideas across borders. And, and many artists have spoken about that. I mean, there's a, um, if you know the Irish novelist James Joyce, he said, um, for myself, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all the cities in the world. In the, in the particular is contained the universal. Um, I, I think that this, this idea that we can find un a universal human connection through art is, is a really important aspect of, of the arts. Um, it's something I thought a lot about when I worked at the British Council because um, we were, we were, uh, you know, part of our remit was organising arts projects in collaboration internationally, and I and I really did f feel, despite the political agenda of the British Council, which no doubt is there, despite that, we were able to do some fantastic projects that brought people together and to have shared um, discussions. So I think there is a sort of there's a real basis to the idea that culture um, and the arts actually con contain something universal and, and, and human. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it's, it, this is why it's a difficult subject, because I think that, you, you, you know, that it's very compelling what the EU is, is doing. And I think um, it, we, can't, we can't dismiss it without at least taking this I, I idea seriously. However, I'd agree with Frank that the EU's cultural objectives, diversity, sustainability, and so on, have little to do with art itself or with the interests of the audiences within member states. Um, and I think that the EU is using the culture to create a kind of mirage of, of unity. Uh, and my experience is that you can't force collaboration between artists or between people, and that has to be a bottom-up organic uh, process. But I think that this background of art and politics is very deeply embedded. Certainly, if, I, if, if we think of the UK, uh, this has been something that's been common to pra the practice of, of arts uh, over the last 25 years, and ironically came really from, from the left, from the new Labour government in the late 1990s, um, uh, which, which brought about a, a series of policies that were absolutely welcomed in the arts communities. For example, they made museums free, national museums free, um, and that happened by 2001, and that was 
welcomed by almost everybody as a great move forward. But the condition for that was that museums and galleries had to deliver a social program. They had to be part of uh, a policy making. And then they became measured and monitored in the same way that other government departments are, are measured. And I think we've now become completely used to the idea that through the arts, we deliver social policy. Through the arts, we, uh, we, we must deliver social inclusion, uh, education, uh, equity, social justice, and so on. And this has been completely incorporated into the way that artists work and, and arts organizations. But I think it's really worth questioning whether that gives us the space um, of freedom that we need to for 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 expression um if if i if we go on to the next few slides i have a few images of what you might call brex art um and um i think that this the the idea of the political role of artists which i'm describing as being something that is quite deeply embedded now really came to the fore during the period after um the referendum in the uk i mean in the in the run up to the referendum really not many artists even talked about the referendum. It wasn't an issue. But in the period after the referendum, you had this um, immediate kind of sense of horror that was expressed by artists of the of, of something lost. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps best expressed by this mural that went up about a year after the referendum by Banksy, um, it, which was on a building just by the ferry terminal in, in Dover, kind of, you know, very carefully positioned to look out to uh, across the English Channel to, to Europe. Um, and if you go to the next slide, the, the next few slides show you some examples of this sort of political campaigning that went on by artists. Mark Wallinger um, pr printed his own posters that were put up all around the place. And this was kind of based on um, uh, a, a, a statement by um, Gerard Winstanley, uh, who was from an organ from the True Levelers, um, a, a group during the English Civil War, which um, completely subverted the meaning of what of what the True Levelers stood for, but said that for freedom, for freedom is the man that will turn the world upside down. Therefore, no wonder he hath enemies. So there was this sense of victimization that artists expressed as if they were the they were the ones that um, were were fighting for for freedom somehow a complete sort of inversion of of the reality next image um can, yeah so this is an artist bemoaning this sort of separation of um, eu uk couples that she imagined would take place um was a sort of melodramatic response to what did actually happen and the next and Michael Landy, who created this um, sort of kiosk uh, selling British merchandise, a sort of satirical response to the idea of that Britain was uh, going, uh, you know, was going to have to renegotiate its trade relations uh, around the world. And the finally, the next one. And this was an idea, um, a, a phone box on, on the just near to the English Channel where you could call double four and leave a message. But this sort of idea of th that we were going to be sep separated from Europe and this gulf that was opening up. So you can sort of see artists uh, really expressing this sort of sense of loss, um, but also turning themselves into, into campaigners. Um, I mean, not all artists reacted in this way. And I think that um, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I think that there is a role for art to be political. And I think this is maybe something we could discuss. I mean, obviously we're here at a, in, a, in a, a gallery, a museum that has played a really important role in, in um, supporting political art. And I think that the exhibitions that are on here are, are very interesting in, in, in respect of this idea of the role that art plays in, in politics. But I, I do strongly feel that art in the service of a particular political campaign or message or organization is something that we have to have to be suspicious of. I mean, the next few slides that I wanted to show you are of work that is political, but I think is more subtle in its in its messaging and is where art, I think, can act to help us kind of understand more about the truth of the world around us, which is what I see as a sort of essential 
part of that. I mean, tra this is Tracy Emin at St Pancras Station. This is perhaps, it's not my favourite piece of work, but I think it is quite successful work is quite beautiful it could be read in several different ways and tracy emin is a is a famously a, a remainer pro-eu artist um and then the, the the next series of slides are um oh yeah this is the, this is a bit of brex architecture this is the british pavilion at venice biennale i didn't commission this one um this was after i left but this this exhibition was called island and it was a comment on um, Brexit, where the architect covered the entire pavilion in scaffolding and created, tried to sort of represent the idea of Britain as as a an island detached from the rest of the the Biennale with this kind of public space on the roof, which was supposedly for debate. I mean, actually, it wasn't really a public space because only a certain number of people were allowed to climb up on the roof and and so on. But you can see you can see where it, where it's headed. Um, the the um the exhibition I went to see at the Tate this week is an artist called Cornelia Parker. So the next few slides are of of her work, and she's another artist who um, has really expressed her revulsion for Britain um, and everything British since the the referendum. And um, she's talking about becoming a German citizen. You might have heard that Anthony Gormley. Um, British sculpture has also renounced his British British citizenship and um, uh, become become German, which I think is a bit rich considering how many people around the UK have supported him as an artist and um, how many of his public works are in cities around the UK. Um, it's, it seems very disrespectful to me, to the British public, that, that he's turned his back on, on Britain. Um, Cornelia Parker, similarly, uh, she has made statements that she feels now is really the time that artists have to be political because they have to kind of campaign against this situation. Um, with Cornelia Parker, I, I think it's a, uh, I think at least a lot of her work is still is still open to interpretation. It's not it's not a sort of campaigning message. If you go to the next slide, yeah, this is a work where she's um, she's made a sort of tent which is based on um, a, a tent that Henry VIII um, had to sign some important treaty but it's made of the um, the cuttings left over from printing poppies um, and it's called war, war Machine and it's a really beautiful it's a really beautiful installation I think um, which actually makes you think about materials and processes and I mean it has a, a an aesthetic value to it um, it's a thoughtful work, even though I think what lies behind it for her is a clear message for the audience. It's it's open to interpretation. And from my point of view, I think art has this potential to um, re to, under to sort of help us to understand complexity. And I think that that's increasingly important in 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 debates about culture and, and more generally is that we that we see that we understand the complexity of situations that we don't simply um, have fixed positions, that we listen to each other, that we're tolerant, that we allow free expression. Um, and I think this is, this is the direction we need to, to move in, which is, to my, and, and my understanding is that the way that the EU is using culture is actually a step away from that because it's, it's defining, it's seeking to define the values that actually should be open and should, should be arrived at through engagement, through debate from the people themselves rather than as a top-down process. Um, so I think this is a, you know, it's interesting to see that even in the work of an artist who has a particular point of view, there's still space for others to interpret. There's, a, I think, a couple more slides and then, it's, and then that's finished. Do you carry on? Yeah, this is a work that, a new work she's made called Flag. Um, it's a film, and unfortunately, I couldn't I couldn't find the film to show you. But it's a it's a really beautiful short film where she's she's gone to a factory that makes Union Jack flags, and she's filmed the process of making a flag. Um, and it's just a very simple, interesting piece. But the 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 point about the film is that she shows it back to front. So she shows the the flag being unmade, if you like. So the film is kind of reversed. And I think it's a really poignant um, 
point she's making, which shows you the pessimism, actually, of the art movement. C if we could think back to Marinetti's positive statement about the future, I think today's generation of political artists are profoundly pessimistic about the future and lacking in um, a sense of vision about where we're, we're headed. And really, all they can see is this kind of loss, this sense of loss and alienation. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a... I think that tells us something ab uh, about the, the the world we're in, but I also think it it makes me wonder about whether we should be looking to artists to solve our political problems, and I I would argue not. <laughs> Is that where? Hello. Yes. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of things that I intend to say was, has been already spoken here, especially by Mr. Furedi, but I try to give something more. I hope that will be interesting for you, just in three points. But let me start in such a personal remember. 90s, first tour on the Poland by Elton John and concert in Warsaw, but especially, in fact, it was the same in every his concert. And Elton John is giving in between songs such a kind of speech about respecting of homosexuality. Paul's, I'm here to say to you that you should respect homosexual people, gay people, because they are not any danger for the society, because they are not worse than any other people, because their sexuality is nothing wrong, and so it's not so. Of course, nothing wrong in this speech, nothing that decent men can deny. But I remember I start to be irritated, and I start to think, men, whom are you talking to this? Whom are you talking such a chunks, why do you have a nerve? Why do you feel in church to preach us about how to respect homosexuality in Poland? You came from the country, it was 90s, you came from the country that where just 20 years ago, just 20 years ago in the 70s, people were imprisoned just because being homosexual. You are from the country where even such a hero like Alan Turing, despite of all these war merits, has been hunted down for death because of his homosexuality. And you are preaching us in the country where never any homosexual human being has been suppressed or offended and especially imprisoned and persecuted because he is homosexual. Why? Uh, one example, in, 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 uh, in b before the Second War, the Music Academy, who was the director of music and state-owned academy in our Heidebond country? Karol Szymanowski who was uh, openly homosexual, of course they are not uh, marching on the streets uh, in incomplete outfit, but everybody knew he's homosexual, but he was an ingenious musician, and that was the point. The difference is we, are, we were always Catholics, and the difference with the Catholics and Protestants it's not a pope, it's not the main. The main difference is a conf uh, confess. Yeah. That makes us much less hysterical about sexuality. Because what in, in such a 17th or 18th century Protestant, if he sinned, he panicked. I'm lost for all time. I'm damned. And what the worst, if anyone else sinned, they all panicked in, uh, around of him because this, th th this guy is, is uh, bringing uh, God's rage on us and we will be lost, everybody, because of this 
see, unless we punished him severely. And what was thinking a Polish Catholic Catholician when he sinned? Oops, gotta go, my vicary. There is no such a big sin that cannot be confessed and that solved. And the worst, and the worst case, you will have to buy a Cooper roof for your chapel, or something like this. <laughs> Maybe it sounds cynical, but it's difference is that sexuality here in Poland was always a part of your privacy, not a public thing. That's why we are completely different at this point. It is not about history. It's also in this moment. You can barely find more left-wing uh, uh, researcher in sociology like uh, Maciej Gdula, who is now a member of uh, Robert Biedron Wiosna party. But he is also a decent scientist. And with some other sociologist, uh, Przemysław Sadura, they made such a quite uh, wide research in Poland, in, now in, in nowadays Poland, about what people are thinking about homosexuality. And in the interview on the Krytyka Polityczna website, far left, really very far left uh, website, in that they interview, they say, well, it's a strange even for us, but the smaller country, the smaller village we are uh, perusing, the more people say on the answer, answering our question, well, if you have the, in the neighborhood uh, two men who are living together as a kind uh, of gay relationship, what do you think about this? And more than 60, 70 percent people in Poland, in the smallest villages says, well, that's not my business. But do you, uh, do you support them? Do you think it's good? No, I think it's not good. I think it's sick, but it's not my business. It's private things of these guys. As long as they are not hurting anyone, it's not my business. I, I have nothing against them. It's not, not mine. Uh, they called it conservative tolerance. In my opinion, it's uh, tolerance. In my opinion, it's just a tolerance without any adjective. Because this, the tolerance is something else, like the acceptance. Well, sorry. I think it's only one example, but it's, we, we could talk about many more differences between Polish culture and between uh, Western cultures because of our history, because we never have a, a Victorian morality. But it's also about our relation with women. In 19th century, it was no something strange in Poland, a woman who has her own business, who run this business, who is uh, without men and uh, single and, and, and entrepreneur or something like this. But generally, why Elton John and many, many other people from the West feel entitled to preach us about such a thing? It's easy. It's simple, because the vision is that there is only one way of progress and they are forward on this way. We are 20 years, 10 years, and maybe half of century behind of them. So if there is only one way, people from there are thinking, if we did such an awful thing, sometimes in our past, that means they here probably still do that. And we have to educate them. I don't say we never, uh, n n never did any uh, really uh, even, even awful things, but the another one, not the same. We have no colonies, we had no slavery, 
we had served them. That is also nothing fine, but, but it's quite a different thing. Problem is that, mm, as it has been said here, uh, of course, the first for, for the European Union alike, for the bureaucracy and uh, what I call liberal liberalistocracy, I will explain what I mean for this higher class of Europe. Of course, the most important value is diversity, but there is only one proper model of diversity. And we are the only one who knows that. And everybody must implement this only model of diversity. You know what I mean. Second point, some, some people like the big star of rock, famous pop singer here in Poland should meet someone who could tell him what I tell to you about our history, about the never Oscar Wilde uh, case in Poland or nothing like that. I had some time a uh, big fun with in discussion with uh, LGBT activists. That was a long time ago and they were still, uh, they were yet willing to discuss. Now they are trying to cancel you and <laughs> there's no discussion. But in this discussion I asked them, listen, why don't you why do you celebrate the anniversary of Stonewall? Uh, that was, you know, Stonewall Club, yeah, the riots. That was on the other side of the ocean. Find something Polish. Find something, some example of suppressing homosexual here in Poland in our history as a, your symbol. <laughs> they swallow the catch. <laughs> and of course, they can find nothing because there were nothing like this. No, no, no Ellenberg uh, scandal, no, no something like this. Okay, uh, but it's just digression. Uh, someone here in Poland who met Mr. Elton John or anywhere else, some artist, some professor, because he was probably met some people from, from, from this upper shelves in Poland. Someone should tell him this. But I'm sure nobody did. Why? Because on this upper shelf in Poland, you have people who are thinking in the same way, who are, don't know, in fact, our own history. I'm writing about Polish history and sometimes meeting people, educated people, people entitled people, I'm really... <laughs> I'm really scared how, how, how few things they are know from Polish history. Nobody knows, for example, that we have in 18th century and the beginning of 90, a black general, Władysław Jabłonowski, from in, in, in Kościuszkowski, insurrection by Kościuszko and later on the legions, was, uh, was black. They called them, soldiers called them our blackie. He was a son of Kant, Jabłonowski, son, <laughs> not a bastard. Can you imagine a French aristocrat or Spain or British or uh, even uh, uh, rich uh, American in, in the beginning of 19th century uh, that uh, simply acknowledged the black son of his uh, wife uh, as his son? Kant Jabłonowski was white and his wife also. They have a black butler who was probably the biological father. It probably the old Kant take his wife somewhere aside and said, <coughs> honey, next time find, if not someone for our class, just find a lover uh, from our race. But he acknowledged it, and, and this black Władysław Jabłonowski was the student in, in a military academy in France uh, with Napoleon Bonaparte, by the way. Ironically, he has been killed in Santo Domingo by black rioters <laughs> at the end. But people don't know that. People don't remember about uh, Warsaw Act. I mean, not this military alliance from, from the 
uh, after World War II, but the law, the bill um, by Polish parliament in 1573 about religion tolerance, that nobody in the Republic can be Republic of two nations, as it is called our state. Nobody can be repressed, nobody can be mistreated because of his religion. But people in Poland don't know, especially in elites, because they are not, in fact, elites of Polish people. They are, in fact, well, I, another word. I, I used to say that we have no middle class in Poland. That's because we have no real democracy. We have, we, we have no middle class, but we have what I called in the middle class. The class in the middle. People who are feel being in the middle between this country, as they used to say, they doesn't like to word Poland. They used to say this country, and between this country and the civilization of the West. So they feel to be a, such a transmission lane and transporting everything good, of course, material goods too, especially first line for themselves, but uh, transporting the ideas, the civilization. Professor Legutko called it uh, the model of transformation by Xerox machine. That is uh, quite good in, 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 in my opinion. And it is also um, such a Portugal word, comprador. Comprador is someone who is running someone else's business in his own country. And that is in post-colonial country theories, uh, uh, the, the term uh, compradorism. Comprador's allied. That is our ally, not only our. That is a problem of every country that have three or more generation under occupation, under partition, after colonization. Because the occupant, the colonizer, needs some local collaborators, and he produced such a kind of post-colonial elite. The result is the alliance between the elites and the people. In America and other countries in the West, if uh, someone poor see someone who is uh, richest and uh, on the better position and higher than him, he's thinking, well, that's, he deserves probably. He were more, uh, he works more, he, he will entrepreneur, whatever, he deserves. Of course, if Poland, nobody believes that someone is, has a better life because he deserves. No, he sold himself. It's uh, from this, this part. Okay, probably it's not too much time of this for me. First thing I would like to say, very, it, it is very important for me. A culture could be a tool of social engineering, but it's very, quite new kind of social engineering. I call this the trolling. In my last book, Trollet Revolution, Strolovana Revolucja, my last book is mostly about this, shortly. Don't, if you are a tycoon, if you feel endangered by the revolution, the traditional way to cope with this is to send military troops, to send police, to imprison them. But it's a better way. If you have a lot of money, you can just subsidize something who is more radical than the revolution itself. And the revolution, as the example of Bolshevik revolution shows, the revolution is absolutely defenseless on this side, on the side of these own radicals. Look, at the, probably the most left-wing governance in Canada, the Ministry of uh, Equality, in 1919, in 20, sorry, in 2019, uh, issued such an um, answer for the needs of a um, feminist organization about women's rights, that we can protect any woman's rights 
because we don't know who is a woman. And try to imagine, in five, six years, and maybe in two years, we can say the same situation, that someone said, we cannot protect human rights, because, according to Peter Singer or any other animalist movement, we don't know who is a human. What is a human being? If you, sex can be fluid, your gender can be fluid, your humanity probably could be fluid. Maybe your dog is uh, in, in, in quarter or in the half human being, and maybe you are only in the half human being because you're not enough tolerant and you have not any condition. In fact, human rights has been trolled, absolutely, because take just one, freedom of speech, most important for the art. There is no freedom of speech because it is also now, it became the human right not to be offended. And wh when you are offended, if you feel offended, so you are right, the human right is not to be criticized. So how can exist freedom of speech if you, if, uh, when I criticize anyone, who is, for example, homosexual, not because of his homosexuality, but because he is a swindler, liar, and generally pig, like our Euro uh, deputies, uh, politician, most celebra homosexual celebrities in Poland, I mean, Robert Biedron. If I criticize him, you are a homophobe. <laughs> you have no right to, to, to have an account on Twitter or on any other place. You know what I mean. Uh, I think the problem, the real problem of the most important problem of the world is not uh, this liberal aristocracy. It's quite um, decadent formation in, in decline. The problem is these tycoons who had a lot of money to produce wokeness. And you can easily think that I'm obsessed, that uh, what I'm talking about is a conspirational theory, uh, conspirationism, something like that. But, okay, three weeks before the first day of selling of my books in Poland. In the United States has been published a book by Vivek Ramaswamy on the title Work Incorporation. And that this guy is how he described himself as a traitor of his class, because he is a millionaire, but not such a real millionaire who just inherited billions, but a scientist who invited a new kind of medicine and gets a lot of money because of this. And what I'm talking about trolling just it's, it's my hypothesis, my uh, observation, he is talking as a kind of whistleblower among the millionaires, the billionaires. Yes, they spent a lot of money to create a walk, a walkness, uh, to, to give uh, some more letters to LGBT, t, 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 whole alphabet, whatever you need to have a critical race theory, who is most racist theory that you can imagine, because, of course, uh, Martin Luther King became a racist in the, the beginning of BLM movement. That's enough, I know. It's too long, especially with such pronunciation than mine, so thank you. Is this mic working? Yes. Uh, please give a round of applause to all of our four uh, excellent, stimulating speakers. Um, so, yes, there's quite a lot of common uh, commonality amongst us. Um, I did try to invite someone who might be far more pro-European uh, Union than we are. We are obviously very EU sceptical. Um, but they, I didn't get a response. So, um, you know, if people feel that there's a lack of balance on on on, the, uh, on this uh, panel, uh, there is also a wall of silence from people who may think differently from uh, my guests here. But um, I, I, part of my um, research in terms of um, 
putting together this panel, I, I, was, was, I was personally very surprised to hear that homosexuality uh, was decriminalized in Poland in 1932, uh, that it was made legal. Uh, and that was a, not, you know, something that I had no idea about. I thought it was fake news. I looked around other sites and they said the same thing. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, incredible. So to hear that story of Elton John um, lambasting Poland um, uh, on his high horse um, uh, about uh, Poland's uh, attitude to homosexuals um, is very interesting. Um, I think that we um, have got a lot of int common grounds about uh, cultural hegemony, what's going on in Europe, and also the influence of the USA and the, the cultural and identity politics that comes from the USA uh, that is uh, seeping into uh, our uh, thinking and institution um, institutions. Uh, so I think a, I thought it was an excellent presentation from uh, all four speakers. Um, there's a globalist um, position perspective too, um, which we can see through um, how the European Union um, uh, amplifies uh, these these messages as we saw through Creative Europe around the environment, around uh, uh, gender uh, issues, um, which um, are tying in with these, um, these, these kind of uh, empty gestures of um, values. So I just want to uh, open out the, the, the questions to some of my um, colleagues here. Um, to be devil's advocate, um, you know, is, is perhaps that is the, un the new universalism, um, that's the EU and uh, other uh, authorities, you know, through arts and culture. We have international festivals and we have biennales across the world. Um, we, you know, we have an opportunity to see a lot of work from across the continent in the, in the United Kingdom and uh, opportunities for British artists to be seen uh, in Europe. And um, uh, isn't that uh, a good thing um, that we have this experimentalism uh, this innovation, conceptual art, uh, uh, art about identity politics, where there is probably a common ground. Um, so what's wrong with that? Well, you know, uh, this kind of, uh, pers the, the person that really captures this idea is uh, a woman called Mona Salen. She used to be the head of the Swedish Social Democratic Party. And she said that I don't care where you were born, nor do I care where you moved to. And the idea was that uh, her type of people were individuals who had no roots in any particular country, and who, if they were to move somewhere else, were better people than the ones that stayed behind. And there's this perception among the artistic community and amongst the European Union that the really good people are the ones that are very mobile. They kind of travel around. You know, I'm, I love traveling, but the idea is, is that if you stay uh, and your relationship is to the place where you were born, then you're a little bit boring. You're a little bit unimaginative. There's something wrong with you. And what they are really saying is that the kind of connections that you have with a particular space and a particular culture is something that should be disrupted, right? And I think that kind of, that's the kind of international networks that are being built. So for example, as an academic, if I, when, when, when I used to apply for European funding, the condition for, for the funding was that I had to have in my research group, you know, people from five or six different countries. And so we did that, but it was totally artificial. I mean, I remember, you know, we had to have a Spanish person and the Spanish person couldn't even read, you know. I mean, his main virtue was that he was Spanish. So he could tick a box and they say, oh, there's a Spanish person. And then we had to get, you know, they were very generous. They wanted to get an East European. And that was like a generic category. It didn't matter where, as long as they were East European. So it became an entirely artificial accomplishment. And I think that's very, very different than what used to happen in the past. So Vicky was talking about James Joyce. And James Joyce wrote Ulysses, his major masterpiece, in Trieste. And 
one of the wonderful thing about Trieste was that in, in Trieste, people spoke four or five different languages. There was an Italian community, there was a Croatian community, a Slovenian community, a Jewish community, you know, there was a Hungarian community, and they all interacted. But the thing was that the, the Jews were Jews, the Croats were Croats, the Slovenians were Slovenians, because at the end of the day, what's interesting about humanity is our differences. You know, you know what's interesting is that I'm a Hungarian, you're Polish, and somebody is a, is a Spanish person. We don't want to somehow, in the name of universalism, erode that distinction. And I think that, that, that true universalism is being able to capture the particularity of our individual and collective experiences and show that even though we have different cultures and different history, there are certain human qualities. There are certain human spiritual uh, dynamics that kind of bring us together, that makes us react in the same kind of way. And that's what universalism is. It's not something that you artificially create and you construct. It's something that you capture through understanding what is the human essence. You know, what is the human essence? And we do that through philosophy, theology, a good understanding of history. We don't do it, you know, by organizing networks. Thank you. Would anyone else in the panel like to come in? I can't remember what the original question um, was, just, but just the, I can the take the a, I mean, I, I, would, I would echo Frank, what Frank says. I think there's a kind of, um, certainly in the, in the world I'm in, architecture world, there's a there's a sort of an, a new group of of people that operate in particularly in academia actually and sa same probably goes for for art who are um, con constantly moving on to the next job wherever that is you know they might be head of a school of architecture in in um, London and then they'll they'll go to uh, Harvard and you know then they might go to Beirut or whatever and it's a sort of circuit and I think that the art world has very much I think this is explains the popularity of biennales and why there are more and more of these kind of international festivals starting up all of the time because it's a circuit and it's sort of it's almost like um, these disciplines have become placeless you know they, they operate in this kind of international space talking to each other um, a dialogue that is really pretty separate from audiences i think and um it, it's interesting because there's always in these application forms you have to fill in you there's always a big section on audience um but it's but it's strangely disconnected from real audiences and i i actually i mean it's interesting where i work at the royal academy of arts um it's it's an independent um arts organization we don't receive any government funding and it means that all our exhibitions, you have to pay quite a lot. You know, it's not like here. I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm sort of amazed that nobody here had to buy a ticket. You can just walk in. You don't have to. Yeah, all right, just those days. But I mean, you can walk in and see any of the exhibitions for free. It's not like that at the Royal Academy. You, you, it, it's, quite, it's quite a commitment to go and see an exhibition. You know, it's like buying a theatre ticket or something. But I would say that we probably have a much closer relationship to our audience um, than many of the national museums because we really totally rely on people coming to buy tickets for our exhibitions to keep the organization going. We have to understand very, in a lot of, you know, really in a, a lot of depth what our audiences are interested in. We really look at their feedback, what they say about the exhibitions. Um, because that's how we we survive and it's strange to be arguing for a commercial relationship like that um because of course i support the arts and i want i want more people to come to to exhibitions i want i want our work to be more accessible and so on but i i do think that um the arts have become top down and disconnected and i think this is a a real problem that um you know, this is this has become it's become a world in its own right that's become se separated from people and and you know what ordinary people are interested in. Um, maybe we should open to the audience because uh, we would love to hear what uh, uh, what uh, you you the public think. 
Hi, thank you very much. My name is Michał Michał Dziedziniewicz, and um, well, it seems like you you presented a very general overview of the state of affairs, state of the union, if I may say so. And uh, I was well, I have two titles, three observations, and one question. In terms of titles, we were also in Poland, so there's a guy called Mrożek, and he wrote a book called Tango. It's a play about a young man whose parents are these wild artists, so his rebellion against his parents is being extremely put together. He wants to have everything organized, everything set up, everything in order, and he is absolutely rebelling against the idea of rebellion. So herein comes the question of the relationship between art and culture, as in art being counterculture. So that's idea number one. Then another title is uh, Heresy by uh, Kowakowski. It's a Polish author, and this is regarding perhaps a reason why, with a way, tolerance towards homosexuality works in Poland, which is that by Catholic standards, according to Kowakowski, we will be punished for our sins after we die. And by Protestant standards or Western standards, you're, the way you're doing in life right now is the measure of divine providence. So if people around you sin and it should bring about calamity, well, you're, you might become a target. You might just stand in the way. So uh, that might explain animosity that is expressed through law. And um, finally, uh, so well, actually no, finally, now no, the third idea. Um, the third idea is that of colonization. So we have colonization, we clearly can talk about economic colonization, and finally, we can talk about cultural colonization in terms of a top-down approach. And uh, I think the question that could help me understand how you all connect together is uh, what, and I'd like to hear a definition from each of you, what is an artist, what is a political artist, what is a political actor, and what is an activist? How, do, how does each of you understand these four terms? That is a long list, yes. Um, yes, uh, but I, th I think this is an interesting question. Um, what is an artist? You don't have to give me an activist. And, and, and an activist is somebody who uh, decides to commit themselves to public life with a view to either defending what exists against encroachment or changing what exists. And I don't think there's a, a big distinction between a political activist and an activist. A political activist may be somebody who uh, look, goes into the political realm to you know, join a political party or starts a political party to do something like that. So there's a little bit of a distinction. Now you can be an activist you can be a political activist and also be an artist, right? Uh, just because you're, you know, just because you're uh, an activist doesn't mean to say you cannot be an, an artist. But it seems, you know, and obviously, you know, there are bad artists and there are good artists and everything else. So that we can have a discussion about that. But it seems to me that a political artist is somebody who decides to subordinate their art to their political commitments. And in the interwar period, in the 1920s, there is a lot of those people on all sides. So Vicky was talking about Martinelli. And Martin is a very good example of that because Martinelli then joins Mussolini and becomes a fascist, you know, sort of later on. Others join the Communist Party and, and their kind of communist commitments you know, be, uh, are the ones that determine what they do. And so that art then becomes subordinated to that. Myself, I would say that a, a political artist is principally a politician who uses art opportunistically, you know, sort of, and, and that's 
But as opposed to an artist, you know, I mean, to me, an artist is, is somebody who's uh, attempting to engage with the human experience in a, in a way that is principally driven by aesthetic concerns and the way that they perceive uh, reality. And therefore, uh, the artistic mission is one where you're trying to express through the, your specific art, you know, sort of the way that, you know, sort of you, you understand your world and your personal experience. You know, some artists are focused on their internal life and it's through their internal life uh, and their, you know, their kind of internal consciousness that they give uh, an expression to that. And I always think that a really good artist doesn't know what they're going to end up with because the artistic journey is one that you can't second guess in the beginning. You, you kind of, even if you have a good idea what you want to do, invariably you end up somewhere else. And that goes for even myself as a, I'm not saying I'm good, but as a writer, you know, I, I often send the uh, publisher my structure, you know, and they say, oh, this is very good for radio, you know, blah, blah, blah. The book is nothing like the structure that, that I send because it's in the course of creativity that there's a force, a mis you know, almost like a, a magical spiritual force that pushes you in, in a different direction to where you in intended to be. And I think all these things are very different. A political artist will never have that problem because they know that they're gonna have to end up with a political message no matter what. So it's a, I think that's a very big distinction. And as Vicky said, there are some very good political artists, you know, but they are political artists rather than, you know, art in the sense that you know, you know, they're not going to be Leonardo da Vinci or James, you know, James Joyce. You know, they're going to be something a little bit different. Well, would you like to respond? To I would try to answer very strong questions. to the question about artists because I'm the worst person to do that here because I tried to be an artist. I failed and I'm very happy because I became a, just every journalist means a normal <laughs> men with, with, with normal family, but of course, of course I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, I would like to say that an artist is a kind of fighter, but unfortunately in this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid the artist is just someone who has such a document. He is a member of association of artists. So, so, he, so he can tell him some artist and whatever he did, whatever he do, he's doing, he's a kind of arts. Uh, it's it's maybe um, very unprofessional what I'm talking to, but artist, I don't know who is an artist, but I know that artist is sometimes very useful for people important and for people who are something to to do uh, and wants make some difference in the world not necessarily in in good intentions there is such a mm, such a mm, name the 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 window of overton i don't know if it uh, is slightly in, in a social science you know it is the window of the overton's window is a this um, part of public discourse that is by majority of people take as a normality. And this over the window can be shift this side, this side. In this moment is extremely shift on the left side, let's say. Of course, it's right and left is a kind of uh, symbols. Uh, what 20 years ago has been perceived as a normal in this moment is conservative. What was perceived as a left in this moment is mainstream. What was rejected as a walkie, extreme, ex extreme left, it's now just a right left wing. And what was conservative, in fact, doesn't exist. It's been canceled. And the artist, in my opinion, was the majority of the workers who pushed these overturned windows so far from the left side. That's all. Um, we could probably have another hour to kind of have these uh, 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 um, 
definitions, trying to find an objective or subjective definitions of. You mentioned, um, but uh, I think we might need to stop on that uh, front about uh, what is an artist, what is a political artist, what is a, an activist and an actor, uh, which is very interesting. Um, you know, Picasso was um, a brilliant artist. Um, he was a member of the Communist Party. He made one very, very important, profound political piece uh, on Guernica uh, and uh, the destruction of Guernica. Um, but is he um, an artist, activist? He's a, certainly an artist. Um, so that's just uh, thrown that out there. Um, and a very important artist. Um, any more um, questions or um, uh, thoughts? And if they are thoughts, um, just keep them a bit uh, uh, brief. Um, but um, questions for the panel? No, okay. Oh, there's one over there. Great. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Frank. You mentioned about uh, that the European culture and values are imported from US. Uh, how do you think it, if it's an uh, intentional plan or this is the natural pro process um, because of US being the leader of the Western world and the, uh, let's say, uh, cultural, uh, yeah, cultural, military, economical leader? Well, you know, what's very interesting is that economically, America is in big trouble and is no longer as dominant as it was beforehand. And it's you know, struggling to compete with China, for example. America has become politically less credible than it would have been like in, during the Cold War or after the Cold War. So when you compare someone like Reagan and, and the mystique of Reagan with Joe Biden, that tells you that there's a big difference there. But the one area where America is dominant is what we call soft power. And I think American soft power, uh, which is principally uh, sort of recycled through Hollywood, through television, through uh, all these streaming services, but also very importantly, MTV and music, you know, is, is really quite important because if you go to, if you talk to young Polish kids and young East European children, you know, the, the music that really moves them is not Polish folk music, right? It's not, you know, Hungarian folk music. They don't go around the radio say, kind of singing the songs of their grandfather, right? It is American music. And when you listen to the words of American music, the words promote the values that we've been criticizing quite systematically all of the time. And when you add to that Netflix and the, I mean, every TV program on Netflix has got the, the, the bad person is always a white man, particularly a white uh, sort of heterosexual man. All the sensitive people on Netflix television program are either black or they're children or they're trans people. I mean, I, I always tell people, if you want to understand American soft power, watch Sex Education. It's a, it's, a, it's a TV program. And even though it's made in England, it's thoroughly saturated by these values where the, it's basically about young people. And the two most interesting people are the two trans young children there. You know, they're the really interesting. The other ones are really boring and or ordinary. So when you have this, these ideals systematically being produced, it does have an impact. I don't think it's a conscious process, although the production values are consciously imposed, you know, by the producers and you know, what Disney, for example, the Disney Corporation, has got a very clear woke kind of agenda. But I think it's it's basically a kind of a spontaneous process of domination. You know, sort of when when you talk about Elton John. Elton John was just one individual lecturing Polish people. But when you have a whole industry who is in the business of telling East Europeans what to think, what's cool, right, that is powerful. It's much more powerful when you say, oh, this is really cool, than when you tell them this is what you've got to think, right? because that's something that 
is more spontaneously internalized. And I really worry about that because I think when I go back to Hungary, the young children there, the 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds are picking this up completely. They're, you know, you know, the parents have got no idea what they're listening to, what, what are the values that they're getting. And I think that is, to me, the biggest uh, challenge of our time, you know, because we need to have some kind of countercultural revolution that kind of fights back against this, you know, and it's difficult because we don't want to be instrumental in our culture in the way that we do, but nevertheless, that is one of the biggest challenges of, you know, how do you, you know, what do you do about this? Because it doesn't matter what you and I think, if the younger generations are influenced by this American soft power. Yeah, I'm not sure this is in, in response to, to that question, but I, I was just thinking um, that, I, you know, in, in terms of what does it mean to be countercultural now? Because, you know, everything is counter. Every, everything is, is um, you know, you, could, it, you can't shock people with art anymore, I think. Um, it's, it's almost more countercultural to defend the, um, the tradition of English art that Marinetti was, was condemning. Uh, it's 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 almost more more controversial to say you're really interested in history and tradition, um, and that that's that's worth exploring and and connecting to. I mean, but of course it's not so useful just to kind of do the opposite thing. Um, but I do think something that's really important is independence of thought, and I think it's one reason why you know the Brexit. Uh, this rift, the the the, vote, the the public vote to leave the EU was so radical because it expressed a desire for independence and sovereignty, in my opinion. Um, and I think we can see that in in almost everything that's followed that, any anybody that takes an independent position on something, is is really condemned almost just because they're not going along with the the mainstream opinion. And so I think. This kind of sticking up for kind of independence of thought is a really, really important principle, and you know it's difficult because you, you know, sometimes you have to you you have to be prepared to be accused of all kinds of things. You 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 have to be quite brave these days, I think. And 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 I don't know about you, but I mean, I find myself self censoring um, what I say a lot of the time because you know, oh, I'm not quite ready to have that battle at this moment, or I don't want to be perceived to be saying something that I'm not. I mean, we live in, in times where it's difficult to behave in a free manner and to express independent thought. And this is really a worrying situation, I think. Um, so I think we have to try to fight for this space for freedom that this, um, that's in the title of the talk. Thank you. Uh, I actually wanted to come back to the artists and activists, but first on the activists, I think it's a new invention. I don't know your your observations on that, but um, I think it's the last maybe five, seven years that it became so prominent. And it for some people it became almost like a day job. And also that it's very common that people would put it on their description, on their profiles, whether on Twitter or somewhere else. And the reason I think is, that I noticed that and I also kind of made a conscious decision because sometimes people would call me an activist for free speech and I would say, no, I'm not an activist. I'm an artist and, I, and I've been a teacher and then a curator and a human being and a daughter and a, a sister and so on. So there could be different descriptions but not an activist. And then in a sense with all these different identities that I have, I care about freedom of speech. Um, and um, and I and I was wondering at that time that maybe the this um, flourishing of activists is linked to how it's being funded, how it's being um, how in a sense you can make a career out of that that you call yourself an activist and then you can attach yourself to some kind of a body that donates money, and. Um, in general, I'm always very suspicious of things that become like a wildfire popular. Uh, we've been doing Passion for Freedom in London for more than 12 years now. Um, we never received any um, state 
money or any big donations. It was always done on a shoestring and with a lot of effort from, from friends around the world and the core of the team was always from the uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and then when the um, Extinction Rebellion started in London and they were blocking majority of the city, central part of the city, and the ambulances couldn't go to hospitals, and then you had these big splashes on the front pages of the newspaper of beautiful performances, visually very enticing. And I look at that, and then I look at the money spent, and I thought, wow, if they gave us this money, we would have major, major public display, display on free speech, but obviously free speech is not going to be funded by anyone because they basically want to control what you think about, what you talk about, who do you meet with. And even when we, were, uh, we got the suggestion of getting um, maybe a sponsorship from private companies, and I started to link, let's say Unilever, where do they say, sell the soap? Oh well, in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, so if I want to talk about women's rights, well, they're very happy to show adverts of fat women, slim women, old women, um, young women, because that will be popular, because then, you know, women are insecure in all countries around the world, and they want to look beautiful, and it's nothing controversial, but then if you start talking about real women's rights, and then you want to sell soap in countries that there is a different approach to this, drastically, then, well, you might not sell that soap. So th that's very interesting for me and suspicious, this whole idea of activism and who the activist is, really. Um, and then with the artists, I think it's uh, probably a very, I don't think it's a controversial thing, but I think it's from personal experience and working with artists and being at different levels of schooling with artists, is it's an internal lead, need to create. It's almost like an urge and it's very hard to stop. And you just, you're just trying to find how it should be channeled and, and how it should be expressed. And as you said, Frank, I agree completely that normally you have an idea what you want to do and it's a perfect idea and then it never ends up like this. So then having this descriptions for funding and this kind of directives, they are like a nightmare for an artist because how to fit in these boxes. And I remember I was reading a British Council funding um, uh, form when I moved to England in 2002, and when it asked me how am I going to address the interests of different diver uh, diverse groups, I thought, I have no idea. And my art is not about that. It's in a sense, if they connect with something I'm trying to express, then wow, amazing. There's some common thread, but it's not I'm going to now design a plan for it. Like, I found it really strange. And I thought, no, this is not for me. I'm never going to apply for British Council funding because that's not for me. I cannot do that. I think, I think you're right about activism in one sense. but. The word's been around a long time. I mean, I was called an activist when I was 20, which was like two centuries ago. Um, <laughs> but the point was that nobody defined themselves an activist, right? They were activists, but they didn't. Well, the difference is that what you're describing is activism has become a, an identity. Yes. I think that's the key thing. And along with all these other identities, so people who, who can barely move, who have never done anything in their lives except occasionally tick the box, call themselves activists. You know, sort of, I'm there about as active as my great grandfather was when he was paralyzed from the neck down. But it doesn't really matter. But that's how they kind of see, you know, perceive themselves. And I think you're right, because genuine people who want to do something uh, will not call themselves an activist. That just sounds stupid, you know, sort of. Uh, I still don't know who is an artist, but I know that average artist has two contradicted dreams. Firstly, to be a rebel, to be against everybody, and secondly, to breach and, <laughs> and renowned. And, uh, you know, it, it is like that, that's for many people uh, to be an activist and an artist in the same time is a solution for, for, for this contradiction. Because, uh, and like, of course, only if you are, if you rank to this uh, enlist to these uh, activities who are well subsidized in this moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
the um, it's quite interesting when one thinks about uh, the artist um, um, slash activist and um, you know the work of Joseph Boyce for example is a very important um, artist uh, uh, of, of our time of, of the time of the 60s and 70s and 80s um, um, was also you know a very conceptual performance artist um, and um, um, but very complex I think you know even though he might have been an activist um, um, uh, he um, looked at um, I think one of the documenta festivals in 1972 he set up a, 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 pro a program a sort of a in socially engaged program around direct democracy and then came up with a manifesto of direct democracy so uh, when I looked at that uh, about the importance of the plebiscite and so forth um, I thought he would probably agree that Brexit is a good thing, actually. You know, um, in, uh, if I looked back at that project, um, because um, uh, he, it was very much about the idea of the plebiscite and uh, and how um, the demos um, uh, should be um, more about the people. And, uh, that was a very interesting art project that I came across by Joseph Boyce. Um, so um, I, I believe in complexity uh, and artists. Um, uh, uh, have uh, uh, good artists, interesting artists, have the complexity. Um, what we have now in terms of activism is is this one-dimensional approach where um, where we look at a lot of the EU-funded projects, and I worked in cultural institutions where I had to chase uh, European Union funding, and I finally resigned because I just thought I cannot do this anymore. It's uh, uh, so I'm in the precarious world of um, a freelance. Uh, arts um, curator and writer um, but um, you know I just remember um, organizations running around themselves trying to find partners in Poland or Finland or Spain or Italy and you know almost like a sort of forced arranged marriage you know to uh, to get EU funding um, and uh, it, it, it it was you know this false um, sense of um, connectivity you know this networking that, that is very dominant now um, and particularly among um, uh, younger artists you know so I, I, I think I'm with Frank that I am concerned what's going on with uh, uh, the kind of almost indoctrination as we saw uh, with by Creative Europe um, appealing to the younger generation uh, the future is queer what's that about you know um, if you want to break that down you can actually you know uh, someone in a corner um, and and they would lose the argument because they have no rational rational thinking about what is a queer future so that's my personal thoughts um any uh, any more thoughts or questions from the audience sorry equip but like I, I thought that the future was supposed to be female Yes, I think uh, suddenly fe yeah, being an uh, adult human female uh, is, is uh, under question. Um, okay, I think um, we've, it's been a fascinating uh, uh, discussion and um, I am so pleased to, that uh, these eminent speakers uh, accepted um, our invitation. And um, it's very important to have this discussion at the moment um, because I think the EU will probably personally again unravel and fracture with regards to what's going on uh, with the Russian war on Ukraine and also the, uh, the, the, these kind of new superpowers, um, not new, but the, the resurgence of um, superpower tensions. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers, Frank Furedi, my co-curator and yes, a colleague, Raphael Zemiewicz, Zimkic, Zimkic and uh, Vicky Richardson. Uh, I think it's so important to hear about the Polish perspective and uh, the, the, the importance of, um, the, it's very worrying to hear that Polish history is being eroded in, uh, in education uh, and that very few uh, young Polish people uh, will know about the stories that you, 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 you highlighted. Um, I'd like to, hmm? they should read. oh, well, they, <laughs> yes, put it on the curriculum. <laughs> That'd be very controversial, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to really thank the Ujastowski uh, Castle Center for Contemporary Art and the directors, Piotr, Marcel, Berta, 
um, because without uh, these three wonderful uh, uh, individuals, we wouldn't be having this, uh, this conversation. Um, and um, I would urge everyone, if you haven't done so, to see uh, the exhibitions here. Uh, they certainly connect with some of the conversations we've had. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, I think it's very exciting and unique that we are seeing contemporary art in a, through a different perspective, in a different lens. And I can't think of any other contemporary art uh, gallery, um, uh, someone with a collection, uh, uh, but also uh, putting on, um, you know, cutting edge work, um, but asking different questions from the homogenous, hegemonic uh, cultural uh, uh, institutions that we see across Europe and beyond in the USA too. So a um, big round of applause to our translators too. Uh, and still two hours of translation work is hard work. Thank you so much. And the wonderful technical team um, who uh, being able to put this together. And we are on YouTube Live, and that will be uh, also um, there for future reference. So uh, thank you there. I'd also like to thank our partners, uh, Academy of Ideas. Um, we've, they've come on board, and they're going to be, um, uh, well, um, in the next session in September, Alistair um, uh, is going to be, uh, who's the Associate Director at uh, Academy of Ideas, will be one of our panel speakers. And we're going to be talking about, da da da, uh, identity politics in the arts. So um, please come to that in uh, late September. Um, Agnieszka, any final words? No. no, I think thank you everyone for coming and please join again and bring your friends. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>